Tonight we're going to continue our series, uh, Foundations of the Christian Life. We're going to be looking at who is Jesus. And so, uh, obviously, that topic is much bigger than we could cover or begin to cover tonight. And so, really, we're going to focus uh, specifically on the nature of Jesus, or really, the two natures of Jesus. And so, I want to start just with this, this quote. It comes from Wayne Grudem. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, he wrote the book uh, Christian Beliefs, that this series is, is loosely based on. A lot of the statements that are in uh, the, tonight's lesson come directly from that book, and then the rest of them come directly from my brain. Uh, <coughs> But in, in the book, he says, in the person of Christ, God physically entered our world. And I just want to take a second at the very outset to just think about that for a second. Okay. For some of you, the Christian life is something that has been familiar to you throughout your entire life. You've grown up with it and you've spent years or decades or five decades or eight decades. You've spent so much time soaking in this truth that God in the person of Jesus, became a man and walked on this earth and made his dwelling among us. And that's incredible. That for us, that's such a familiar truth. But I think sometimes in its familiarity, we can lose just how extraordinary it really is. What a thing to say that the God who is incomprehensible, that uh, expands beyond every kind of boundary, that is omnipotent and all-knowing and omnipresent, that he would take human form in the person of Jesus so that he could live and walk amongst us. So when we talk about the two natures of Jesus, this is the truth that we're trying to grasp. This is what we're grappling with, that God in Christ became a man. He physically entered our world and became like us. So when we talk about the natures of Jesus, we ask questions like this. How could Jesus be both God and man? Was he God and then became a man and then went back to being God? Did he stop being God when he took on human form? Did his humanity cease when he returned to heaven? These are questions that we uh, grapple with when we talk about the two natures of Jesus. And so tonight, uh, for whatever amount of time my voice will sustain me, I hope that you really enjoyed uh, Caleb being here on Sunday. I thought he did an incredible job. I'm grateful to God for his friendship and for his ministry. Uh, but God knew exactly what he was doing when that was planned because it was planned long ago. And I was way too sick to be able to preach on Sunday. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I had to. Uh, I tried to smile, you know, and, and greet him and welcome him up there. But I was so blessed uh, by the fact that that he was there. Uh, so tonight, for whatever amount of time the Lord gives me grace to speak, I'm going to try to talk about this. So let me give you some big words. Uh, hypostatic union. Those are not words that we typically use, but they are very important theological words that teach us about the two natures of Jesus. So this is from a guy named David Mathis at a website called Desiring God. This whole, uh, all three uh, small paragraphs here come from David Mathis. He said, hypostatic union sounds fancy in English, but it's actually a simple term. Hypostatic means personal. The hypostatic union is the personal union of Jesus's two natures. The hypostatic union is the mysterious joining of the divine and the human uh, and the human in one person of Jesus. Jesus has two complete natures. Now, that's probably the most important thing you need to grasp tonight. When we say Jesus has two natures, we mean he is fully God and fully man. And the emphasis is on fully. He's not part of one and part of the other. He is at the same time both things, fully God and fully man. Jesus has two complete natures, one fully human and one fully divine. What the doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches us is that these two natures are united in one person, in the God-man. Jesus is not two persons. He is one person. The hypostatic union is the joining, mysterious though it be, of the divine and the human in the one person of Jesus. So Jesus, fully God, fully man. Two natures in one person. That's, that's something to hang on to. That is central Christian doctrine. And we benefit from the fact that early Christians wrestled with this. And they have taught us how to talk about this. Because Jesus came and he knew exactly who he was. He came as the Son of Man who was the Son of God. He knew that he was fully man and fully God. But his disciples really struggled to understand how could this be? What does it even mean when John said that he came and made his dwelling among us? But for us we know because we've inherited this from the church. It's one of the benefits of church history. We stand on the shoulders of all those people who came before us. We didn't have to decide just by starting fresh and looking at our Bibles, how do we express the natures of Jesus? We know this because this is central Christian doctrine, the hypostatic union, that Jesus is one person with two natures, fully God and fully man. 
So, now we're going to talk about what it means that Jesus is fully human. And we're going to look up a bunch of verses, and we're just going to talk about them. Uh, I don't have as many slides tonight as I normally do. Instead, we're going to spend more time on each one of these slides. So, Jesus is fully human. How do we know that? Well, he was born the child of a human mother. Would somebody read Matthew 1.18 for us? And this is a passage that is going to come up again and again. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. Mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be the child through the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus was born the child of a human mother. His human mother, Mary, conceived him and gave birth to Jesus. Totally apart from uh, the, the relationship with her earthly husband, but in a completely natural way in terms of she conceived a child and gave birth to a child. So Jesus was fully human because he was naturally born by his mother. Uh, Jesus was fully human because he grew as a human and he became strong. This is one of those things uh, that seems mysterious to us because we don't understand how could Jesus, if he is fully God, be in a position where he would grow. How could he be a child who would learn how to walk and learn how to talk? Uh, and in the same way, Luke uh, 2 also says that he increased in wisdom. So we know that Jesus learned things, that he learned through his experiences, that he learned through his education, that he was completely a man in the same way that we are. And yet, the entire time, he was fully God. But as a man, he got tired. We see that in John 4, 6. Would somebody read that for us? And if somebody wants to look up John 19, 28, we'll, look, we'll see that one too. Jacob's will was there, and Jesus tried as he was, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Yeah, so we know that Jesus was fully human because he experienced things like fatigue. Uh, when he is in the midst of his ministry and he is constantly encountering all these people and they're constantly vying for his attention and he is uh, preaching and serving and leading. He grows tired. He grows weary and he retreats to fall asleep. We remember that famous scene uh, where he and his disciples are out on the water and the waves are overtaking the boat and they are fearful and then they cry out to Jesus and he is asleep. And he's not asleep because he's just messing with his disciples. Like He's asleep because he's exhausted. Because the ministry that he was doing was incredibly taxing to him. In the same way, he became hungry. And we saw Jesus eat. And it wasn't just for show. In the same way, after his resurrection, he encounters his disciples out on the seashore. And they're, they're cooking fish. And he eats. Somebody read John 19.28 for us. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be... Fulfilled, said, I thirst. Hmm. Jesus famously thirsted. Like the, this, is a, this is a scene uh, that, that all of us remember. And we, we know that in his humanity, his body, when he was subjecting himself to the torment and terror of crucifixion, that he experienced deep physical pain. You know, when you think about Jesus in the garden on the night uh, that he was betrayed, and he is crying out to God and saying, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. He's talking about this <laughs> cup of suffering because he knows that the very next day, when he is hanging there on that cross, he will have endured the, the unimaginable physical torment of the cross, of the beatings, of the crucifixion. And he would be even worse, under the wrath of God against all of the sin of the world. And so Jesus in this moment is crying out to God. He is thirsty. He has been tired. We've seen him in his humanity uh, grow. He is fully human. And finally, we know that he is fully human in that he physically rose from the dead. Would somebody read, I don't know why I didn't have it there, would somebody read Luke 24, 39? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Amen. So Jesus, when he rose from the dead, goes to his disciples who are utterly confused. 
even though he had tried to prepare them. He had tried to teach them what it meant that he was going to be killed and rise again on the third day. They just didn't have a concept for what it would mean that Jesus, their Lord, would be crucified on a cross and then come back from the grave. And so when he shows up, he, he is literally using his body and saying, touch my hands, touch my feet, put your hand in my side. See this miracle that has occurred, that the Holy Spirit has brought me back from the dead, that I, Jesus, am the man who died, but am standing here alive before you. You know, there's, there are some people who want to claim parts of the Bible. They want to claim some of Christianity, but they just can't, <clears throat> for whatever reason, they just can't get on board with the whole thing. And so they'll say, well, I believe that Jesus was resurrected, but I don't think he was actually like bodily or physically resurrected. Instead, I think he was spiritually resurrected. Well, there's nothing miraculous about a spiritual resurrection. Jesus was physically resurrected. He, his body got up and walked out of the grave. And one of the reasons we can answer the question when we say Jesus is fully God and fully man, it's not just that he was fully God and fully man, he is fully God and fully man, is that right now, Jesus, who has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, for all we know, he's the only person in heaven with a body. Now that's not necessarily going to be that way forever, but right now he is there and he, he is never going to give up his bodily form. He has forever united his divinity with our humanity and he will forever exist as Jesus the God-man. And so, for us, it is critical that Jesus is fully human, as we're going to see in just a second. But we know that He continues to be fully human. Because as He rose from the dead, He didn't just spiritually rise. Instead, He rose as the same man that He became when He condescended and made His dwelling on this earth among us. Jesus is fully human. And Jesus also, as a human, experienced human emotions. And so one of those scenes, it, it, in, when he is encountering the faith of those who are Gentiles, uh, Matthew 8 tells us that he marveled at the faith of the centurion. Think about what that means. What does it mean to marvel at something? He was astonished. He was shocked. So Jesus has been going throughout Israel, and he's been teaching his people. You know, John 3 tells us that Jesus came into his own, and his, his own received him not. Jesus came teaching among the people of Israel and was rejected and was, re and was rejected. But one day he encounters this centurion and he begins to share with this centurion the good news of the kingdom of God. And this centurion's eyes are opened. And he sees this faith in this Gentile. And because of that, he marvels. He is astonished or shocked because Jesus is a human who experiences human emotions. Because as God, there's no such thing as surprise, there's nothing unexpected. But Jesus, in his humanity, marvels at the faith of the centurion. In the same way, he experiences the depth of sorrow because he weeps at the death of his friend Lazarus. Now, all of these things have two sides to them because in each moment, Jesus never ceases to be fully God. So did he know that his friend Lazarus was going to die? Well, as God, of course he did. He knows everything. But in his humanity, was he grieved over the fact that his friend had passed away as he stood with his sisters and those who cared about Lazarus? Yeah, he was grieved by that he, because he was a human being and he suffered human emotion. So each time one of us gathers with other Christians at a funeral and we mourn the loss of somebody that we love and you experience the sorrow that comes along with that, that's what Jesus experiences at the death of Lazarus, even though he knows the future that awaited Lazarus. The fact that Lazarus had then passed into paradise, that he was standing there with the Father. As a total aside... I've always been really interested in the story of Lazarus. Here he is, this faithful man, this friend of Jesus, and he dies, and he goes to heaven. Lazarus enters into paradise. Who do you think was the person that had to go tap him on the shoulder and say, hey man, guess what? <laughs> you got to go back. That's kind of a bad deal, you know? Um, but Lazarus is brought back from the dead. And Jesus called him forth, but not before he experiences and shows us this emotion and that he weeps at the grave of his friend and mourning with those. He prayed, Hebrews 5, 7 tells us, with loud cries and tears that Jesus was a human as we are who had emotions like we do. And, and even in his relationship to the Father, he experienced the same kind of pouring out his heart, speaking from the depths of his soul. He did all of that in the same way that we do. So when you find yourself 
laying on the floor, putting your face up against the carpet, crying out to God for victory or help or assistance in your moment of need, those are the kinds of prayers that Jesus prayed. He was desperate when He sought the Father in the same way that we are. He experienced those kinds of human emotions even in His prayers. And then would somebody read for us Matthew 26, 38? Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Mm. Think about that. This is the night that Judas betrays Jesus. This is after they have shared that final meal together. They are there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says to his disciples, My soul is troubled unto death. What would it be like if, if somebody that you care about, if your best friend in the world looked you in the eyes and said, My soul is troubled unto death. And for the disciples, this is not just their friend, it's their leader. It's the one who has been telling them about these plans that God has for His kingdom to come to the earth, to make all things new, to change everything. And now He's saying that His soul is troubled unto death. Jesus was fully human and experienced the full range of human emotion. And then, thank God, uh, the final thing on Jesus' humanity, He was fully human like us, but always He was without sin. And so I want to read these three passages really quickly. Uh, so somebody, uh, if you would, look up 2 Corinthians 5.21, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5. And when, when you have it, just tell me which one you're going to read and go for it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made, he made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. So, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we could be what He is. Uh, McCafferty had this, uh, I, I, there's this figure for church history who said, He became what we are to make us like He is. And she had that posted on social media for the longest time and helped me memorize it. He became what we are to make us like He is. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. He was the one without sin. But He took on our sin. He took on the, the penalty and the pain and the punishment for our sin so that we could be what He is, so that we could have His righteousness, His perfect acceptance in relationship with God. What's next? Uh, 1 Peter 2.22 He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. He committed no sin. And Peter says that as plainly as he can. That Jesus was the sinless one who died in the place of sinners. And then somebody read 1 John 3, 5. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He appeared to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So... The main reason to look at these three verses, they all tell you the same thing, that Jesus was the sinless one. But the reason to look at all three of them is just to make it clear that the Bible is perfectly consistent. There's never a question of whether or not Jesus committed even any sin, not the smallest sin. He lived the perfect life, which was critical for him to do because Hebrews 4.15 tells us, For we do not have a high priest in Jesus who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He can sympathize with our weaknesses in every way. He felt all of our emotions. He felt all of our weakness. But he was one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So, Jesus is our great high priest. He is our advocate. He is the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father. But for Him to do that, for Him to be that perfect mediator, He had to be able to understand the depths of our, the depths of the temptations that we've experienced, the struggle that we have as humans in this fallen world. And Jesus was the one who every time did it right. Every time when we were tempted to go the wrong way, Jesus went the right way. He is fully human like us, yet without sin. So, uh, two more truths on this, on fully human. <clears throat> One, Jesus had to be hu uh, fully human to be our perfect representative. So would somebody read Romans 5.19? For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Jesus is the second Adam. He is the one who perfectly obeyed where Adam failed. Where Adam was disobedient to God's instruction, Jesus was always faithful to God's instruction. And so he is the one, the second Adam, who 
has the ability to be our representative, the one who takes away our sins. And he can only do that because he is the substitute who died in our place. Would somebody read Hebrews 2.17? For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. He made atonement for the sins of the people. And Hebrews, in that passage, I love that so much, because it, it is so clear that he had to do this. In order to serve as our high priest, he had to become a human like we are, who could sympathize with our weaknesses and understand our experience so that he could be that priest and advocate before the Father. But not only that, it says that he had to be like we are. He had to take on flesh and blood and live on this planet and walk in obedience to God so that He could make atonement for us. Or as the ESV says, so that He could be the propitiation for our sins. He was the sacrifice that turned away God's wrath. Because as God looked at you, and He looked at you, and He looked at you, you deserve judgment. You deserve the death that Christ died on the cross. But instead, Jesus stepped in front of you to be your substitute, to be that sacrifice. He gave His life for yours. And that's what we're taught here in Hebrews 2.17, is that Jesus became this perfect sacrifice. He is the substitute who bore our penalty in our place so that we could have this life with God forever. So Jesus had to be fully human to be our perfect representative. He had to be fully human to die our death in our place. And because He did, God has traded His he is, we have uh, gained His righteousness, and He has taken on the penalty for our sin. So, now let's talk about Je Jesus being fully God. We've emphasized the fact that He is fully man. We've talked about a myriad ways that He is fully human, that He experienced all of our emotions, that He grew like we did, that He experienced even the temptations that we do, yet He was always without sin. But let's talk about the fact that He was fully God. So Jesus, though He was born in a natural way, was conceived in a supernatural fashion. So somebody read Matthew 1, 18 for us a moment ago, but maybe read it one more time. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. She was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. So, unlike the rest of us, uh, Jesus was conceived in a special way, in a supernatural way. Because even though he was born to an earthly mother, uh, he, he was not conceived uh, through the work of an earthly father. Instead, it was the work of the Holy Spirit that conceived Jesus and he was brought to us in this supernatural fashion. We also know that Jesus was fully God because he was worshipped by the angels. Uh, we see this in Luke 2.11. We see it in Hebrews 1.6. Would, uh, would somebody read uh, each of those for us? Luke 2.11, For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. A Savior, who is Christ the Lord. God, is, God sent Messiah to be His representative and rescue His people. And would somebody read Hebrews 1.6? And again, when God brings His firstborn into the world, He says that all God's angels worship Him. Amen. So, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. He is the firstborn of heaven. He is the one to whom the angels worship. You notice that in the New Testament, uh, when angels fall down to worship human beings, they stop them. But for Jesus, who is fully God, He is the one who angels are supposed to worship, who the Father directs the worship of the angels toward. Not only that, but Jesus declared His own divinity. Uh, we see this in John 8, 58. Would somebody read that for us? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And so Jesus in that moment invokes the divine name in the same way. So, so this is Greek, and he says uh, the words, ego a me. Uh, but those are the same words that Yahweh said when he said, before, when he said I am. So when Moses said, who shall I tell them sent me? Who is sending me unto Pharaoh to deliver the people of Israel? God says... I am. And Jesus says, I am. He declares in the very same way that He is God. <coughs> the God of Israel, <laughs> excuse me, the God of Israel, the one who has been sent to deliver the people. 
You want to throw me another one of these? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'm going to try to get through this. Um, so Colossians 1.19 and Colossians 2.9 say almost the very same thing. But I wanted you to see that because something, in the Bible, something being in the Bible one time, it's still true. But when the Bible says the same thing multiple times or in multiple ways, it's, it's there for our benefit so that we can know, so that we can uh, more fully understand it and grasp what it says and grasp its importance. So Colossians 1.19 says, For in Him, that's Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So, think about this for a moment. There's a man named Jesus of Nazareth who is walking around and he's telling people that he is God's divine representative. That he is the one who was sent from heaven to represent God on the earth. But, again, try to place yourself there. Nobody's ever seen this before. There's a man named Jesus walking around telling people that he's from heaven, that he is God, that he is ushering in God's kingdom, that everything is going to change, and that one day everyone would bow down to his rule. That's a pretty strange thing. But the people following Jesus, watching him do these miracles, seeing the work that he's doing in the world, they begin to realize <clears throat> that Jesus is from heaven, that he is the one representing God. And Colossians 2.9 says almost the same thing. For in Him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So, you get both things there. Jesus is fully God, and He is fully man. The good news is, coming toward the end, as we talked about, because He is both fully God and fully man, Jesus is able to serve as our mediator. Would somebody read 1 Timothy 2.5? For well, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. <coughs> the reason that is so important that we grasp these two natures of Jesus is so that we can understand the role that he plays for us. It should add for us such a depth of meaning and perspective that God could have saved us in any way He wanted to. But instead, in His divine plan that He set out from eternity past, He purposed always for His Son Jesus to be the one who would take on the form of a servant, who would come and live amongst us. He had all of the riches and glories of heaven and He took on the indignity of this world of the sickness, of the disease, of the filth, of the sin, of the relational strain and the brokenness. When he was walking around doing ministry, his mother and his brothers, his family members, rejected him. They thought he was crazy. They would tell him, you're embarrassing us. Come home. Stop it. Jesus' mother, the one who the angel appeared to and said, your son is going to be called Emmanuel. Jesus stepped down from his throne in order to accomplish this plan because it was that important for someone who is like us, who represents us, who understands us to be the one pleading our case in the courtroom of heaven, saying to the Father, the just judge of all the earth, love them, forgive them, bear with them, be patient. Yes, I know that Josh has fallen into sin again. Yes, I know he has given in temptation again. Don't give up on him. Don't stop loving him. I've walked with these people. Jesus walked among us human beings. He knows how fragile and frail and weak and sinful we are. But he loves us. And his love for you is so great and so incredible that not only did He come into this world and suffer all of that, but He did everything that it took to guarantee that you could have eternal life with God forever. So understanding these two natures of Jesus is understanding the most amazing miracle in history, that Jesus, who is God, became a man. He became the God-man so that we, as men and women, could live with God forever. The incarnation... And the hypostatic union, the fact that Jesus 
took among himself both of these natures in his one person is a miracle because our salvation was hanging in the balance. And because he did those things, he was able to be our representative, but not only that, he was able to be the substitute. God allowed Jesus to take our place on that cross to bear his wrath against all of our sin so that when he looks at you, he can see the righteousness of Christ. There really isn't anything more beautiful than that. There's not anything more compelling or amazing than that. This is the miracle of God's plan that he set forth in eternity past that was accomplished in Jesus that will benefit and bless us forever. It's something for us to sing about. It's something for us to rejoice over. And it's something for us to hold on to. To know that every time you're tempted, every time you struggle, and even every time you fail, Jesus is in heaven pleading your case, being your advocate, and the mediator between you and the Father. He did everything necessary to save you. He's doing everything necessary to bring you home safely. So rejoice in that. Lo love and appreciate this truth because it is the greatest miracle in history. Let me pray for you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Father, thank you so much uh, for this evening. Thank you uh, for these faithful church members, God. I, I just pray your blessings on them. God, as we have spent a few minutes this evening talking about this wonderful truth, that Jesus, your Son, stepped down from heaven into the dirt and the muck of this world. God, because He loves us, He came to be our mediator. He took on the full penalty and punishment of our sin. God, He did it because He loves us. Because You love us. And God, we know that He stands now as our advocate in heaven. Our mediator who continues to plead for us. So God, help us this evening to cling to this truth and to love Jesus more because of it. God, help us to walk and live faithfully because we know we follow in the footsteps of our great high priest, the one who has gone before us and who will come again for us. God, we lift up the many prayer requests that we mentioned earlier. God, all of those unspoken requests that weren't yet mentioned. Lord, we know that you are aware of them all. And so God, we just beg for your mercy. We thank you for this church family where we can love one another and support one another and walk through life together bearing one another's burdens. And so God, I just ask your blessings on these, uh, these that are gathered here in this room, those who will watch this later, God. We thank you for Cornerstone, for all that you are doing, and we ask that you would do even more for the sake of your kingdom and your glory. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.